Would you agree this is a complex work? Yeah. Let me suggest something. We're at 50. I'm going to skip to 69. What if by doing that at 69, he's reflecting back? What if we focus on 69 because it anticipates what's coming and it will allow us to see in the language that he's using that he's going to be using a certain set of terms, a vocabulary. A certain set of terms. In order to make the points he's making, he has to use a certain set of terms in order to make the conclusion that he wants to come to. But these terms came out of this section. In other words, this is the vocabulary he needs to continue at this point and apply it to where we most want to see it, which is in the soul of man. How are you doing, sir? From this point on, we're going to be talking about the soul of man. All the terms that he's going to use to describe the soul and the drama it faces, the drama and the conflicts it faces, all the problems that every soul has to face because of the nature and the condition of the soul. Have to be identified. Now, once you get the natural problems of the, of the soul, which is that because it has certain powers and does certain things, and then, then you have to have the second set of problems. Now, internal to the soul is the way it functions. And its conflicts that has to be the result of this. So the terms that we're going to use are developed here. He's then going to apply it to the soul going to describe the condition of the soul in such a way to show that necessarily it's going to have structural problems. That is, all kinds of things are going on, squirting powers, drives. Then he's going to talk about what happens in, internally to the soul, that is to say the way it functions and the nature of its conflicts. These are independent because this is the education of the soul. This is how to bring it into a harmony to allow the condition for seeing. There must be a harmony of the soul and all of its parts. so that it can then have vision on two levels, right? Dreams and prophetic. <coughs> That's a goal, vision. So, what if we try it? What if we focus here, take a look at the way he sets it up, 
Does it therefore set the conditions for what's coming? If we look at the language from here on, would you agree it's going to have contained a certain set of terms? The origin of those terms, we are assuming, can be found in this section, and therefore it has a unity to it. So it develops slowly and brings all the conflicts necessary, inherent, because this is the transition from cosmology to the psychology of the soul. For, and preparing the soul for seeing, or philosophically it would be a spiritual epistemology. That is to say, we know the word, therefore, for no noetic functions. Does that, are you associating that with the first 50 pages? I'm a little confused. No, see, we reach this point. Mm -hmm. Cosmology. Okay. Thank you. The bridge from psychology, from cosmology to psychology, <clears throat> are going to be a common set of terms that he develops. When he develops those common set of terms, then he's going to say you can also understand those on another level for the mind, noetic functions. That's the way it's going. Okay. Possible? Any questions before we jump in? Are we going to go... Once we see from 69 on, are we going to go back and look at 50 well, and how the terms are developed, or 50 to 69? That's the, the goal is. The goal is to see whether this is true. Cool. But that means we're going to have to stay, stay here and then confirm it. Cool. And we should be able to, by the way, through here, get each of the categories, get the major categories of the subdivisions within each one, because that's the way he develops it. So within this, therefore, we're going to get a set of categories, which are always holes, and they're necessary parts. And the way the parts combine. Okay, that's where we're going. Okay. Okay, to do that, he's going to talk about essentially now uh, two kinds of causes. especially people like Plato, do their work. They impose their 
metaphysics on natural processes or nature. And um, I've always enjoyed that because it's so simple. And I have a friend of mine, Harry Dravidovich, who believes it. <coughs> And he's had a lot of practice believing things. And he told me, after believing many things, he finally was able to believe this. <laughs> uh, remember him? He used to come over to the house. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I want to return to this, uh, the major idea. So. Now. <clears throat> I just want to start with, with a couple of sentences above 68E, between D and E. He just gives a discussion on how to understand colors and the origin of colors. And he says, you know what? Colors are just a function of the way in which the eye sees through certain kinds of uh, mechanisms built into the eye that are fluid. And he says, that's what you, very much like the prismatic idea that we have today. Here's his conclusion. And he just made a distinction between light green, blue, red, etc. As to the rest, it is fairly clear from these examples what are the mixtures with which we ought to identify them if we would preserve probability in our account. So this whole thing is probability. Okay. Skipping down to the beginning of that paragraph on page 177. Such then, notice, right? Such then being the necessary nature of all these things the artificer of the most fair and good took them over at that time amongst things generated when he was in, engendering the self-sufficing and the most perfect God. And their inherent properties he used as subservient causes, but himself designed the good in all that was being generated. Everything that's generated up to this point, it's all, whatever is generated, well, that's good. Wherefore, one ought, one, therefore one ought to distinguish two kinds of causes the necessary and the divine. And in all things to seek after the divine for the sake of gaining a life of blessedness, as far as our nature admits thereof, and to seek the necessary for the sake of the divine. Hey, look here. To seek the necessary for the sake of the divine. Why? Huh. Well, I'm going to go a little further. Reck Here's the big sentence, you know, or pardon me, phrase. Reckoning, 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 uh, reckoning that without the former, it's impossible to, dis to discern by themselves alone the divine objects after which we strive, or to apprehend them, or in any way partake thereof. What did you just say? If we don't seek the necessary, we won't be able to discern the divine, right? That you need the, the necessary in order to... to if we don't do this, uh -huh. if we don't go in this way, uh -huh. We will we'll never be able to get to the divine, uh, apprehend the divine. Yeah, look at the categories. Um, 
to apprehend or in any way partake thereof. Right. To either apprehend them or partake. Right. Ah, 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 ah. No. Oh, they, I guess it's discern by themselves, apprehended, or you were right. Now, I don't know these words because English is not my primary language. What's the Stephanus? Is it 68D? Is that where we are? Yeah, we're 68D actually. That's 68D. right, 69, top page 179. Alvin yeah. Taylor. That's oh, why. Alvin Taylor. Oh, did you find it? No. So 68 E? 68. Low, and then it's moving into this area. Right? Oh, okay. This is a divine thing. Got so it. You should investigate the necessary. Okay. okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Unless we go through the necessary, it's impossible to discern the, uh, the, the divine by themselves, unless you go through the necessary. So you have to go through the necessary for the sake of the divine, or you'll fail to apprehend or partake thereof. Therefore, the doorway to the divine is through the necessary. necessary. Causes, right? Pardon me? Causes. Yeah, yeah, causes. Necessary causes, divine causes. Got to go through necessary causes. Ah. Hmm. Tell me. Huh. Go ahead. That's right where we're going. You're absolutely right. Right? Okay, all set. Where are we going? Understanding the difference between necessary and We got it. Yeah. Hmm. <coughs> okay, all set. Hold it. Um, what the implication here is, is that... Pardon me? <clears throat> the implication yeah. is that we cannot see the divine directly. Right. So we have to see how the necessary works right. to get an idea of right. what the divine is doing. In order to figure out what the divine is doing. Yeah, in order to, two words. Apprehend, Apprehend and, and partake. Partake. And partake. Right. Yes. Right. Uh, okay. Now, uh, we're now going to get the transition into, uh, we should have put it up here, but we didn't. Oh, here. Um, psychology and anatomy, right? That's, that's, it goes together. So, we do not agree. We need a reader. Uh oh. I just had one quick question then. Um, if what Lyndon said is true, then uh, it's somewhat parallel then to uh, how you have to just read a text in, in general. That you need to know the, the, the details, you have to understand the details in order to have a chance at. I'm certainly planning on the fact that uh, we can make it stronger. If it turns out that by 
understanding what he means by necessary causes is a model for understanding. Yes. Right on. Right, brother. Yeah. 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 Sorry, would you repeat that? I was thinking about something else. What was the would you repeat the point you just made to Daniel? I was looking at something else and I didn't hear it. He was saying that it would be even stronger if it turns out that by necessary causes, it turns out to be a model for understanding. Because I was saying when we read, we understand the details as opposed to the sort of gestalt theory that you just kind of skim through and right. don't understand it. And then you get a hole and then you go back and then the details spill themselves out. Okay. So in here are going is the discussion on <coughs> causes. And let's see how he now talks about, so he's now looking back, he's now looking back, and let's pick it up and go a couple of lines, shall we? <coughs> Seeing then that we have now lying before us and thoroughly sifted, like wood ready for the joiner, the various kinds of causes. What have we got in front of us? The various kinds of causes are all laid out in front of us, out of which the rest of our account must be woven together. What are we going to take? We're going to take these causes, and what are we going to do? We're going to weave them together. This is where we're going. Let us once more, for a moment, revert to our starting point. And uh, remember, that's way back at uh, 50, and our text goes to uh, references section at 47. So uh, we'll put that aside and keep going, all right? Let us once more, for a moment, revert to our starting point and hence proceeds rapidly to the point from which we arrived hither. In this way, we shall endeavor now to supplement our story with a conclusion and a crown of harmony with what has gone before. What are you going to do? It's we shall go endeavor back. now to crown it. <clears throat> right. Crowning conclusion. That's his goal. There it is. Now he's going to reflect. Now we're going to get a reflection. As we stated at the commencement, all these things were in a state of disorder, just like way back to 29, remember? Mm -hmm. Right? So again, it picks up the same relationships that existed previously. He keeps doing this again and again in each subject that he entertains. Out of which he then has to show the condition for order. Hey, same thing here. <clears throat> the initial condition of the soul is going to be such that it's going to need an order, therefore he's going to have to show it in a certain natural chaos. But that's where we're going. Let's hold it for a moment, okay? As we say to the command, at the commencement, all these things were in a state of disorder when God implanted in them proportion, proportions, both severally and in relation to themselves and in their relation to one another, <clears throat> so far as it was in any way possible for them to be in harmony and analogy. For at that time, Nothing partook thereof save by accident, nor was it possible to name anything worth mentioning which bore the names we now give them, such as fire, water, or any of the other elements. But he, in the first place, set all these in order, and then out of these he constructed this present universe, one single living creature, containing within itself all living creatures, both mortal and immortal. And he himself acts as the constructor of things divine, 
but the structure of mortal things, he commanded his own generated sons to execute. And they, imitating him, on receiving the immortal principle of soul, framed around it a mortal body. Here we go. Here we go now. What are we going to get? The anatomy. And picture this, especially if you have an interest in comparative studies. So, hey, look here. And they, imitating him on receiving the immortal principle, so framed around it a mortal body and gave it all the body to be its vehicle and housed therein besides another form of soul, the three kinds of souls, even the mortal form, which has within it passions, fearful, unavoidable. Firstly, now pick it up now. There's seven. Uh, pleasure, a most mighty lure to evil. Next, pains, which put good to rout. Besides these, rashness, fear, foolish counselors both, and anger, hard to dissuade, and hope, uh, ready to seduce. <laughs> and blending these, now comes the shift, and blending these with irrational sensation and with all daring lust, they thus compounded it in necessary fashion, the mortal kind of soul. What's he putting into place in the soul? Hmm. Pleasure, pains, angers, hope, fears, lusts, rashness, right? <clears throat> Lend them all into this soul. He's got a mess now. Therefore, <laughs> since they scrupled to pollute the divine, unless through absolute necessity, they planted the mortal kind apart therein. Right? That's what they did. They planted the mortal kind apart therefrom in another chamber of the body, building an isthmus and a boundary for the head and the chest by setting between them the neck. See, now he's going to, t he's going to say, I'll tell you what, he said, I'll take, take the human form, and he's going to say, I'll tell you why the things are the way they should be. Right? So he's going to give you the reasons why, philosophically, your toes are where they are, and your belly is exactly where it should be. But while doing it, see, what's he doing? He's doing another whole part. Got the category body, breaking into parts, I was going to show how they interrelate. He's going to have them and, it, and the way they interrelate with one another. Right? So here we go. Um, see, to the end that they might remain apart. Mm. What does it? The isthmus, right? The neck. He's, that separates the head from the rest. Right, that's, it. that's the essence, right? Ah, sets them apart. And within the chest, notice he's building a thorax, as it's called. They fashion the mortal kind of soul. And inasmuch as one part thereof is better and one worse, they built a division within the cavity of the thorax as to fence off two separate chambers for men and women by placing the midriff between them as a screen. Oh! That part of the soul then, which partakes of courage and, sp and spirit, since it's a lover of victory, they, have plant they planted more near to the head between the midriff and the neck. 
in order that it might hearken to the reason. And in conjunction therewith, might forcibly subdue the tribe of desires whereof they should utterly ref refuse to yield willing obedience to the word of command from the citadel of reason, which of course is the head, right? Mm. So what should you do? You have to draw it. Right? You have to draw it. Now, would you, know, would you not agree we need a volunteer to draw it who's with great skill, should we not? Well, let's vote. I think we should uh, pick on a volunteer and we'll all vote for Julie Hygard to be the artist to put it all together. Everyone agree? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, no. I, I think Brad... Don't you, go for, don't you go for democracy? Well... <laughs> we all agreed. Yeah, but there's actually somebody better than me. <laughs> and that's Brad. No, no. What, yeah, okay. Uh, but is it not true that you study these things? I do. I, I try to. Wait a minute. Let me check. Should we call on someone who's been studying these things? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah therefore, would our choice is good. Hmm? Mm -hmm. It's a good choice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, look, in the description, though, he's going to pick up, you see, the problem of the soul is now in the body, and now he's going to talk about all the struggles necessarily that are going to follow once you put the soul in the body. That's where he's going. And the heart, which is the junction of the veins, is found in <clears throat> the fount of, of the blood and circulates vigorously <clears throat> through all the limbs they appointed to be the chamber of the bodyguard. To the end, that when the heat of passion boils up, as soon as reason passes the word around that some unjust action is being done, which affects it, either from without or possibly even from the interior desires, Every organ of the sense and the body might quickly perceive through all the channels, through the injunctions and the threats and all the ways, obey and follow them, thus allowing their best part to be the leader of them all. What is it? It all responds to the cry of justice and injustice. Right? That all the parts of the body line up, they all go together. That's a means of relief for the leaping of the heart in times when dangers are expected and passion is excited, since they knew all such swelling of the passionate parts was a, would arise from the action of fire. Okay. Hey, so he's picking up the idea of fire that he previously developed. Watch the way he, the kinds of elements he picks up. They contrived and implanted the form of the lungs. This is, in the first place, soft and bloodless. Now you can take all of the quality, pardon me, all the adjectives used to describe these terms. These become the terms that he has identified previously. And moreover, it contains within it perforated cavities like those of a sponge so that when it receives the breath and it drinks, and the drink, it might have a cooling effect and furnish relief and comfort of the burning heat. The rest of the paragraph, you can see what he's doing. See what he's doing? Talking about the, the, uh, the way in which uh, the lungs react and breath and drink, the effect it has on the lungs and the cooling and heating. Got it? Okay, I'm going to the next paragraph. And all that part of the soul which is subject to the appetites for food and drink and all the other wants that are due to the nature of the body, they planted in the parts midway between the midriff and the boundary at the navel, fashioning, as it were, a manger in all this region for the feeding of the body. And there they tied up this part of the soul as though it were a creature which, though savage, they might necessarily keep joined to the rest and feed. If the mortal stock were to exist at all. Okay, therefore, in, in terms of this, you're talking about the consequences, right? 
So, Pierre, if I may, uh, the gods are setting this up in a the junior gods are setting this up in a way because they're fearful of something. Because they're what? Are they fearful that the the gods? The gods, the junior, the junior gods. No, there's no fear. They're imitating the creator. What the creator did in the universe, the junior gods are doing to the body of man. They're fabricating, if you can put it in terms of analogy, as the demiurgos created the universe, so the junior gods are putting together and fashioning the human body. Therefore, all of the properties that were developed in the universe, they are junior gods are now going to use and bring into the body and the soul. Okay, as he does that, it's going to be negatives and positives. Agree as you go down this list. See, now you have to see the negatives and the positives and the tension between the two in order to make the transition where we want to go, which is into divination. So if I could get someone to read, uh, I can enjoy it while someone else reads and uh, take it from there. I'll read. Okay. Where do you want me to start? Um, 71 on the top of uh, 185, which is uh, 71A. For these reasons, it's got it, they stationed it in that mm -hmm. position. Go ahead. For these reasons, they stationed it in that position. And inasmuch as they knew that it would not understand reason, and that, even if it did, have a, some share in the perception of reasons, it would have no natural instinct to pay heed to any of them, but would be bewitched for the most part, both day and night, by images and phantasms. Okay, see so the conditions it's in? Yes or no? Got it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, therefore, go ahead. To guard against this God devised, to guard against this, God devised and constructed the form of the liver and placed <coughs> in that part's abode. And he fashioned it dense and smooth and bright and sweet. Okay, those terms are key terms which previously were identified and described through sets of causes. Okay, keep going yet containing bitterness. Another one. That okay. the power of thoughts which proceed from the mind, moving in the liver, as in a mirror, which receives impressions and provides visible images, should frighten this part of the soul. For when the mental power bears down upon it with stern threats, it uses a kindred portion of the liver's bitterness and makes it swiftly suffuse the whole liver. Go ahead. So that it exhibits bilious colors, and by contractions makes it all wrinkled and rough. Moreover, as regards the lobe and passages and gates of the liver, the first of these it bends back from the straight and compresses, while it blocks the others and closes them up, and thus it produces pains and nausea. Uh, right. What condition it's in? It wakes it up. Full, right, full of pains and nausea, right, frightens, fearful images. Go ahead. On the other hand, when a breath of mildness from intellect paints on the liver appearances of the opposite kind <coughs> and calms down its bitterness by refusing to move or touch the nature opposite to itself and using upon the liver the sweetness inherent therein, rectifies all its parts so as to make them straight and smooth and free. It causes the part of the soul planted round the liver to be cheerful and serene, so that in the night it passes into its time sensibly, being occupied in its slumbers with divination. Well, how did it do that? 
By becoming cheerful and serene. It had to have um, the dianoia or intellect. Mm -hmm. um, but how did it do it? Yeah, that's it true. It says a breath of mildness. Ah, more. Right. Go ahead, that's a good Paints point. on the liver. On the other hand, when a breath of mildness from the intellect, from the dianoia, paints on the liver appearances of the opposite kind. What does it do? It's, uh, it's a, I guess it's painting images of the opposite kinds to the things just described above, right? That are in, that are native to that part of the you know, so mortal soul. Think of language. And the breath of mildness from the intellect paints on the liver appearances <coughs> of the opposite kind, mm -hmm. opposite of what was just described. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh. Oh. What does that do? It calms down the bitterness by refusing to move or touch the, the nature opposite to itself. So it's bringing from the intellect images. Right? It's bringing see, it's bringing images from the intellect, and it paints a different picture than what is <coughs> we could say is going on within the the physiology of the substance, mm -hmm. and that calms it. Mm -hmm. Ah. And what does that allow? It rectifies, it makes them straight, smooth, and free. Cheerful and serene. Well, is just that part the of the area. soul which is fine. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Well, it's, it, um, straight and smooth and free, it causes the part of the soul planted around the liver to be cheerful and serene so that in the night, it passes its time sensibly being occupied in its slumbers with divination. Right. Seeing that in Logos and Phronesis, it has, it's not participating. So seeing that in reason and intelligence, it has no share. So it has no Logos and no Phronesis mm -hmm. without both, right? Then what can happen? Divination. Divination emerges, divination emerges. Now he's going to reflect on what he just said. Look at this, see? For they who constructed us, remembering the injunction of the Father, when he enjoined upon them to make the mortal kind as good as they possibly could, they rectified the uh, vile part of us by thus establishing therein the organ of divination that it might in some degree lay hold of truth. And that God gave unto man's foolishness gift of divination. Yeah? Hey, you know what? A sufficient token of this is that no man achieves true and, and inspired divination when he's in his uh, uh, rational mind, which is really a non phrenesis mind. But only when the power of his intelligence is fettered in sleep or when it's distraught by disease or by reason of some divine inspiration. But it belongs, uh, it belongs to a man when in his right mind to recollect and ponder both the things spoken in dream or in waking vision by the divining and the inspired nature and all the visionary forms that were seen and by means of reasoning to discern about them all wherein they are significant for whom they portend good or evil in the future, the past, or the present. And now he's going to say, I'll tell you who can't play this game. Right? I'll tell you who can't play this game. This part's important, of course. You kind of chuckle at this one. Right? Ah, oh, excuse me, my reader. But it's not the task. But it, yeah, but it is not the task of him who has been in a state of frenzy and still continues therein to judge the apparitions and voices seen or uttered by himself. For it was well said of old that to do and to know one's own and oneself belongs only to him who is sound of mind. Right, don't lose it. Go ahead. Wherefore, also it is customary to set the tribe of prophets to pass judgment upon these inspired divinations. And they, indeed themselves, are named diviners by certain who are wholly ignorant of the truth that they are not divine. 
and they in, and they indeed themselves are named diviners by certain who are wholly ignorant of the truth that they are not diviners but interpreters of the mysterious voice and apparitions for whom the most fitting name would be prophets of things divine. Okay, what was just said? I don't know. Can't judge it yourself if you're in a if you're in a state. What does he think of the interpreters? They're out. Yeah. Mm. Okay, um, what's he, what, have we, what have we got there then? We're talking about cosmology, psychology, anatomy, and now suddenly in rectifying the problems, in rectifying the problems of the soul, when you rectify that, divination. Not only that, you're saying, hey, you know what? You've got to be in a certain state of mind. And it also comes also in dreams, does it not? Mm -hmm. Dreams and visions? Spoken in dreams, awakening. Hmm. Hmm. So, what, this all comes from a discussion on the liver. Mm. And therefore, now he has to return to the liver and now tell you why you have to keep it clean and why you have to keep it in good shape, which is what he's going to do, right? Mm. Which is exactly what we'd expect. <coughs> um. For the, what? Mm. Yeah, go ahead. For these reasons, then, the nature of the liver is such as we have stated and situated in the region we have described for the sake of divination. Moreover, when the individual creature is alive, this organ affords signs that are fairly manifest. But when deprived of life, it becomes blind and the divinations it presents are too much obscured to have any clear significance. The structure of the organ, which adjoins it, which is said to be the spleen, Go ahead. with its seat on the left, is for the sake of the liver, to keep it always bright and clean, as a wiper that is laid beside a mirror always prepared and ready to hand. Wherefore also, whenever any impurities due to ailments of the body occur round about the liver, the loose texture of the spleen cleanses and absorbs them all, seeing that it is woven of a stuff that is porous and bloodless. Hence, when it is filled with the off-scourings, the spleen grows to be large and festered. And conversely, when the body is cleansed, it is reduced and shrinks back to its primal state. Concerning the soul, then, what part of it is mortal, what part immortal, and where and with what companions, for what reasons, these have been housed apart. Only if God occurred could we dare to affirm that our account is true. But that our account is probable, we must dare to affirm now, and to affirm still most positively as our inquiry proceeds. Affirm, therefore, let it be. <coughs>
Look, he's going to continue this and uh, going to go into the bones, the marrow, the brain, the mouth, the brain, and uh, going to talk about speech. He's going to go through this entire thing. Right? And he's going to talk about the condition of sin and how it has to be rectified. <coughs> so he's going to go all through this, and then he's going to then talk about blending, and that's at 77. Because with the blending, we take part of the third kind of soul, which is at uh, 77, and that's between the midriff and the navel, and there's a great deal of power turned into that. Respiration, all of that. Now, once he gets all of this in place, and he's talked about each of them, then he can talk about the next level which we really are interested in, which is the nature of disease. Because he has a very interesting idea of disease, you know. One of the worst diseases is stupidity. <laughs> right? So look here. This is where we're going. And you're going to see the transition at, uh, okay. at 82, then goes into the soul diseases and psychological conditions. And that's going to go for the next 10 parts. That's where we're going. Okay? So, right now, um, we took it to 77C, just about. Okay, now. Okay, now. All of the terms he's using, all of the terms he's using, what are we saying about them? They all must have been discussed and identified previously, and he's using them now in terms of the body. Now he's going to go into the level of the soul at 782 to 92, talking about the disease of the soul. And therefore we have a different kind of psychology emerge there, philosophical. And he's going to have that great conclusion at 90 to 92, and that's where we're going, okay? So, uh, now, is this helpful or structural? See, that's, a, that's what he does. He structures it out this way. You follow the structure, and you can see, therefore, how to proceed. And it leads to the great principle of divination, both in dreams and in waking world. So... <laughs> so would you agree we can get would you not agree Julie volunteer to do this yeah. kind of philosophical anatomy and psychology anatomy yes. that was thoughtful should, we should give her a hand on that shouldn't yeah. we I can see her lecture at UCI changed a bit now. She gets up there, she's going to talk to those dudes about divination and how to clean the liver and the spleen. And... Yeah. Okay. Well, I better go home right away and get started. <laughs> You're putting all your books away quickly, Julie. <laughs> I better go home and get started. <laughs> okay, good place to quit. Right, good place. Okay. Astrology. The house of